to remember many details about them. Our chief Washington correspondent, Mike Emanuel, here with more on this. I thought my memory was shot. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. I wonder whether it was coaching from lawyers, but uh, Nathan Wade was very tight-lipped when confronted by Fox News last week on Capitol Hill. You're going to follow those instructions? Do you have a message for the uh, committee this morning? What do you think about it? Did you speak with the eight floors? Are you going to invoke the Fifth Amendment? Are you going to say anything of relevance to them? In May 2022, Wade billed for a meeting with the White House Counsel's Office at his hourly rate of $250. But when asked about it, Wade could not detail the purpose of the meeting. Wade used some version of I don't recall more than 30 times when questioned by lawmakers and staff during closed door testimony. Wade left the Trump case due to his romantic relationship with Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis. Willis warned Wade against revealing case details to lawmakers, noting the possibility of potential harm to ongoing legal proceedings. House Judiciary Chairman Jim Jordan says Wade's meetings sound very political. You got the whole thing with Nathan Wade, taxpayer money going to Nathan Wade. He was traveling to Washington to meet with the DOJ, the White House, the January 6th committee, all in this effort to go after President Trump. In that transcript released yesterday, Wade told lawmakers, quote, no one at the White House, the White House Counsel's Office, the Department of Justice or the January 6th committee directed, ordered, asked, coerced or pressured me or any member of my investigative team to seek or not to seek an indictment against anyone. On other aspects, Wade was not as confident of the facts, John. All right, Mike. Uh, well, I don't recall. It's something we're used to him saying. It's Indeed. pretty much how he answered every one of Ashley Merchant's questions in court, isn't it? Indeed. Thanks, Absolutely. Mike. Good to see you. And we will dig into more of this with Andy McCarthy. He joins us coming up in our next hour with his thoughts about all of this. Sandra. All right. We flew through the first half hour here. Vice President Harris pouring all she's got into the battleground state of Pennsylvania. But is Pennsylvania loving her back? We'll ask Washington Examiner columnist Selena Zito. She'll join us live. As the U.S. investigates an alarming leak that may have compromised Israel's military plans for a strike against Iran. The former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren, reacts. Coming up next. We'll have to see how the investigation plays out. But there are a lot of, a lot of Iran sympathizers in this administration. And keep in mind, Iran is the same you know, regime that's threatening to kill Donald Trump. Many of you have seen the statement from the FBI who have indicated that they are uh, investigating this. Um, they've announced that, and I will defer to them to speak to it. Uh, certainly, we would take um, uh, any uh, unauthorized disclosure. It's something that we take very seriously, and it is, of course, in incredibly concerning. That was the State Department moments ago as the Biden administration in investigates an alarming intel leak that may have com compromised Israel's plans to strike back against Iran. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S., Michael Oren, is on deck. He will react. But first, Jillian Turner's live from the State Department for us. So, Jillian, what's the White House saying about this leak? Uh, so far, the White House is staying dark since yesterday on this, Sandra. The big breaking news of today so far is what you just mentioned, the FBI confirming they are now investigating um, leaked top secret U.S. intelligence that detailed the U.S. assessment of an Israeli plan to strike back against Iran in retaliation for that missile bombardment that happened just about three weeks ago. This is all happening while Secretary of State Antony Blinken is on the ground in Israel meeting with the Prime Minister today. They had a two and a half hour long meeting. Um, what they're hoping to do is restart ceasefire negotiations as soon as possible. Now, this, of course, leaked intelligence on their agenda at that meeting today. Here's what a couple of senior U.S. leaders said yesterday. We are aware of the reports and we are definitely uh, very concerned uh, about them. We have seen these uh, reports as well. Uh, and as the president said earlier this morning, we're certainly concerned about them. We're deeply concerned and the president remains deeply concerned uh, about any leakage of classified information into the public domain. Uh, uh, that, that is not supposed to happen. 
So again, that sounds from yesterday, sounding like that may be it for what we get in terms of specific details right now on the leaked intelligence. Um, take a listen to this. This is a little bit more of what Vedant Patel just said in that State Department briefing that is now ongoing, Sandra. This is a very dangerous situation. We've got people who are sympathetic to Iran currently in this administration. They'll find the leaker if they want to. They've got the means to do it. All right, that's obviously not Vedant Patel. We had a soundbite of him queued up from just a couple of moments ago. That was former President Trump's national security advisor, um, uh, Robert O'Brien, him saying it's a very dangerous situation, making it a little, bo a little bit political, accusing the U.S. government, the Biden administration official, uh, uh, administration of harboring some pro-Iranian officials that may have contributed to this leak. But again, the big... The big picture question, Sandra, as the FBI begins to untangle these threads is obviously who leaked or hacked this information? And then is it going to impinge the IDF moving forward? Are they going to have to curtail any of their plans to launch counterattacks against Iran because some of this information is now public? Sandra. All big and very serious questions. Uh, as you report live from a very busy State Department today, uh, Jillian Turner, thank you very much. John. All right, Sandra, let's bring in Michael Oren, the former Israeli ambassador to the United States. Michael, you probably heard Jillian just there saying what's unknown at this point is whether or not this leak will impinge on Israel's ability for a retaliatory strike against Iran. What do you think? I, I don't think so, John. It's always good to be with you. I don't think so. I think that what, what it will impact is uh, the willingness of Israeli leaders to uh, share information and to coordinate uh, with their American counterparts. Uh, the United States has been asking us to uh, coordinate, to be very transparent about what our intentions are in terms of the retaliation against Iran. It's very difficult to do that if um, if whatever we tell the United States, whatever we tell the administration, you know, finds its way into a pro-Iranian platform. That's what happened here. And it's not just that, it's not just the essence of the leak. It was what was in these documents. And what was in these documents was an attempt um, by the United States to, to penetrate Israeli security, uh, to find out what our plans were. Uh, and that does not engender a tremendous amount of trust mm. uh, between the two sides. At the end of the day, Israel is going to do what it has to do to defend itself against Iran. Uh, Iran will continue to uh, to throw the entire Middle East into upheaval uh, unless it is deterred. Uh, on the subject of coordination, it's it's our understanding that Netanyahu and Biden have had conversations about what an Israeli counterattack against Iran would look like, and that oil facilities and nuclear would be off the table, that the strike would be against a military target. Do you believe that's going to be the case, or, or could the IDF and the Israeli Air Force go after a nuclear facility or an oil platform? I believe that the, the reports about what Israel will do and what it won't do are all coming from the American side, not from the Israeli side. Uh, we're very tight-lipped about it, and as far as uh, Israel is concerned, I think as far as the Israeli people are concerned, every every target has to be on the table. Simply has to be. This can't be tit for tat, John. Uh, and I think that the whatever blow we give to the Iranians, it has to be something close to a knockout blow. Uh, with the Iranians understanding that there's another blow after that that could be even more devastating. All right. So there's the situation with Iran, then there's the situation with Hezbollah that's ongoing, and now the situation with Hamas. And what comes after Yahya Sinwar, now that he has gone from the playing field? Apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal, he gave instructions for how Hamas should proceed should he be taken out. He said he also began preparing for his death, advising Hamas members that Israel would likely offer concessions to end the war after he was gone. In negotiations with Israel, he said Hamas would be in the stronger position, according to Arab mediators familiar with his messages. It sounds like he gave instructions to Hamas don't sign a ceasefire, hold out for the best possible deal. Uh, and for him, at least while he was running the show, the best possible deal was no deal. Uh, and, and indeed, and it's interesting, the, the, the Biden administration, which hasn't, you know, that could lead to sort of I would, limited deals with certain Hamas commanders for the release of, say, four or five hostages. No, oh, interesting. I didn't think of the idea of some side deals as opposed to one grand deal. But Anthony Blinken is over there in Israel right now, and he's pushing the idea again of a ceasefire. But but if you're Netanyahu in the Israeli uh, war cabinet, you've got Hamas on the ropes. You might be able to reach a deal for the hostages, as you pointed out, with the fractured leadership there. You, you're pounding Hezbollah in Lebanon, and you're about to launch a retaliatory strike against Iran. 
I mean, there's 14 days until the U.S. election. We can see why Blinken would be pushing for a ceasefire. But if, but if you're the Israeli leadership, why would you go for a ceasefire now when you're pounding your enemies? Well, for the last couple of days in the Israeli press, I've been saying that the Secretary of State would visit Israel soon because it's part of what we call here the bear hug. It's, uh, it's a almost a procession of senior uh, American officials who have been coming to Israel. It began with the commander of CENTCOM visiting us. Uh, with the understanding that if these senior officials are in Israel, then Israel will not launch that strike against Iran while they're mm -hmm. here. Um, and you could keep kicking that can down the wall until you get past uh, November 5th. And I think that's very important uh, for this administration not to have this attack occur uh, before November 5th. Um, so that is certainly on the on the on the on the table, uh, and the question is: Was the United States willing to give Israel in return for, say, holding fire for another two weeks? It's very difficult. Every day that passes, John, our our, our reason for going against Iran will be forgotten by much of the American public. Certainly, after everything that's happened in America, the hurricanes and the and the and the and the debates and the and the election, uh, people may not even remember that massive attack of two hundred Iranian ballistic missiles on our on our communities. So uh, no, the answer is no. Israel has to pursue this battle. It has to defeat Hamas to the degree that we can defeat Hamas, and it has to drive Hezbollah north of the Latani River and away from our northern border, so that hundred thousand Israelis can go back to their homes. All right. Well, the next two weeks will be interesting on so many fronts. Michael, great to see you and spend time with you as always. Thanks. Hey, good to see you, Don. All right. Bye.